One Health Care, sponsored by 21 News and The Vindicator. We're coming to you live from the Jewish Community Center in Youngstown, and we'd like to thank the JCC for hosting us. Over the next 90 minutes, average citizens will question Congressman Tim Ryan on a wide range of issues relating to health care reform. The questions were selected by the staff of The Vindicator and 21 News from an online registration. We selected questions representing the various aspects of the health care debate. The congressman has not seen the questions in advance. We also have with us tonight three professionals from our community representing different aspects of the health care debate. They are Buzz Pishker, Forum Health Care President and Chief Executive Officer. Bob Schroeder, the President and Chief Operating Officer of Humility of Mary Health Partners, and Dr. Thomas Boniface, Clinical Associate Professor of Orthopedics at neo -UCOM. We will periodically go to one of our experts for a question as well. I should also mention all of the congressional members representing the Mahoney and Shenango Valleys were invited to be here tonight. Most said they would prefer to remain in Washington where votes are being taken. Congressman Ryan was the only congressman to take the time to be here tonight, and we thank him for that. For those of you watching tonight's broadcast, if you follow us on Twitter and Facebook, you can send us a question online. I want to welcome all the members of the audience who are with us tonight and uh, those who took the time to submit questions here for our conversation on health care. We thank you for joining us for the program tonight. With that, I begin, uh, would like to begin by asking the first question of Congressman Ryan. Uh, now that Congress is back in session and last Wednesday, the President made it clear that he favors the public option but is not necessarily married to that as something that has to be in the final reform, uh, uh, health care reform bill. What do you think the chances are that we're going to see some kind of health care this year? Well, nothing's 100 percent, but I think, you know, if I had to give it a percent, I'd say probably 90 percent. I really, really believe that this is the time something's going to happen. And, and some people are critical of the fact that it's taking too long. Some people are critical of the fact that we're jamming it down their throats and there's points all in between. But I think this is really the year. We have a, a president who, ha who still has some popularity. Um, his popularity went up uh, after the speech uh, on Wednesday night. And I think why it's going to happen is because average people who are living in the United States of America know it needs to happen. Know that, knows that these chances don't come around all that often. And so I think people feel it. They feel it in their wallet. Small business people feel it. Big business people feel it. Um, everybody is, is feeling the squeeze. So I think there's a really, really good shot it happens, and it will probably happen, you know, in the next couple of months. Has, the, has President Obama staked his presidency on this single issue? Well, I think to a certain extent he has. I mean, he'll, it'll be a much different presidency if he passes it, and it'll be a much different presidency if he doesn't pass it. So I think to a, a certain extent he said, I'm all in. Okay. Congressman, thanks for joining us tonight. Our first questioner tonight is Leonard Christ. Leonard, if uh, you would go to the microphone. Leonard is a student from Youngstown. We'd like to see true universal health care, not mandated health care, where everybody must purchase a policy. Uh, Leonard, your question, please. Um, yeah, I mean, Barack Obama came into the White House with you know, a larger majority than President Bush had. Uh, there's super majorities in both houses of Congress. Why not just push it through? They didn't really have these kind of town, town halls for, like, say, the Patriot Act or the Iraq, maybe the Iraq War they did, but not the Patriot Act. So, Well, the, you know, unlike the Patriot Act, or so, so we think, um, you know, health care is something that touches everybody's life. And I don't think health care is something that you can just jam through. And as difficult as these conversations are, um, they all touch people, and they all touch people in different ways. So you're a student, you have one opinion. I mean, I was at the Canfield Fair for four or five hours. I got 150 or 200 different opinions on what we need to do for health care because you're on Medicaid or you're on Medicare or you're, you have a certain policy. So it's so different and it's so personal that I think it's something that needs to be discussed and worked through. We've got to do this thing right. Because at the end of the day, I think politically, people would be hurt if we jam something down their throats and then people don't like it. So we have to take our time with this. This, this, is, not, this is not tax cuts where you can say, everyone's getting a tax cut. The worst case scenario is you're going to get $300 back. Um, this is going to affect people in their day-to-day -day life, especially if they have some kind of tragedy in their life. So I think it's very, very personal, and that's why it's, it's going to take a little time. And they say... You know, making legislation is like making sausage. You don't want to watch the process. Leonard, any follow-up? Um, no. Okay. OK. 
Okay. Thank you. Right, thank you for your question. Sandra Martin. Sandra, would you go to the microphone, please? Sandra is a, a student at social work, or works in uh, social work at uh, Youngstown State University. And uh, Sandra says there are too many redundancies and inefficiencies in the current healthcare system that we need to, we need centralized and computerized records that maintain a, a patient's privacy. Sandra, your question, please. Um, Congressman, my original question was, um, whenever I try to discuss um, the Obama policy in, with my fellow classmates and with um, the everyday citizen, there's a lot of misinformation out there exactly how we can save the money that um, um, I spoke of before. But could you tell us where we could find a good, reliable, easy to understand source of information instead of so much misinformation for the public? Well, I've been recommending to people just in general that if you watch MSNBC, and that's what you watch, or you watch CNN all the time, that you take a week out of your life and you watch Fox News. And if you watch Fox News every single hour of every single day, then you need to take a week out of your life and watch either CNN or MSNBC or some alternative. Because each side is saying something different. And the people that know most that I've just been interacting with, especially over the August break, are, have been people who watch all of these different TV programs because they kind of take all the information and then they come to their own conclusion. They may be inclined to believe something or the other. Um, but you can go right on to uh, Thomas, uh, the Thomas website, which is the Library of Congress, and actually get the bill and read it. Um, and people have had all kinds of questions, mm -hmm. and they said, have you read the bill? I said, yes, I've read the bill. You can read the bill, too, and go mm -hmm. to this website and, and check it out. But all the information is there. You know, the, the Democratic leadership has an outline of the bill. The Republican leadership has critiques of the bill. And I, I'd say, you, I mean, you've got to spend some time because it's very complicated. But I, you can go to these leadership websites, and probably the president probably has one, too. There's a lot of information on our website that you can access as well. But I would say if you're not inclined to get on the internet and spend hours of your life trying to really understand this, I would just try to switch up which kind of media you're getting, which radio stations, which TV stations, and you'll get a good cross-section. Thank you. Information is a good thing. The more sources you check, the more informed you're going to be. Okay. Yeah, and there's, there's one, uh, the St. Petersburg, I think it's the St. Petersburg newspaper. They have a Pulitzer Prize winning fact check. Um, uh, kind of process that they go through where you hear all these stories about what healthcare has in it or does not have in it, and they fact check it. And there's different kind of fact check internet sites too that you can go to, and I think those are very helpful because they'll outline and they have rating systems as to this is a whopper of a lie or this is, this is true. One of the ratings is pants on fire, that the lie is so bad. So um, they have all kinds of rating systems, but I, they're very helpful. Do you use those? I try. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Tim Francisco. Is Tim with us? He's close to the microphone. Good. Tim is a professor from Poland. He thinks the current system is neither efficient nor fair. He supports tort reform and the public option. Tim, your question, please. Uh, yes, Congressman. As was mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, the public option is now on the compromise table, and it likely will go. Um, that was billed as one of the means of actually keeping costs down at the top as opposed to increasing the number of insured at the bottom, for lack of a better word. How do we intend to keep those costs down without a public option, and will you vote for a bill without a public option? I am supportive of the public option. I think it's important to have in there, but it's not a deal breaker for me because I think there are so many other good things in the bill that will be helpful. And I think a public option would help control costs. Um, but um, one of the points that I think no one's really been talking about is that if we have insurance reform, if we have um, you can't be denied coverage because of a pre-existing condition, if we have you, you will be capped at how much you can spend a year on your own health care. Now your policies are capped. We're saying it's going to be capped to how much you'll have to spend, but you'll still get coverage. If we put some of these reforms in, and make it, universal, make, make it universal coverage, where insurance companies have to cover people. There's something that's very significant that's going to happen. It will now become in the insurance company's interest 
to keep people healthy. So you will see a shift. Now the game is trying to keep people, if you have diabetes, they'll say, well, you have diabetes, we're not gonna cover you, because we know what that leads to. That's you know, six or $7,000 a year. That may lead to amputations. We try to avoid having that in our portfolio. But now if they have to cover you, all of a sudden their time, money, resources, energy, staff work is gonna be spent on how do we keep these people healthy? And you'll see insurance companies, it will now be in their interest. It will, now, it will be profitable. You know, and one gentleman, Michael Pollan, who writes a lot about the, the food we eat and uh, sustainable agriculture and those kind of things, says that an insurance company will see a chicken nugget on a kid's lunch tray and see $400,000 coming out of their bottom line one day. So this will dramatically shift what insurance companies and how insurance companies operate. And I think that's how you're going to see savings. You'll see insurance companies investing into physical ed programs, preventative programs, wellness programs, it'll be in their interest to do that. So although the public option may not be there, which I think it should be, I think there's a st still significant savings that are gonna happen down the line because we're gonna make it in their interest to help keep people healthy. Tim, do you have a follow-up? So then you would support it without the public option as well? I, I don't want to, but no. I will. You know, if, if on balance, if on balance, it has all of these other things in there. I mean, I don't want it to be a completely gutted bill and we just pass it so we can have a press conference saying, hey, we passed right. health care reform, right. great. And then it doesn't help anybody. We're getting the same problems that we have. So as long as all those other reforms are intact and there's a co-op, because I think we still need that competition in there um, for you know, more choice for people to go and access health care. So I don't, the co-op's OK. Public option is better. But um, I'm loose on that. I'm not, you know, I'm not married to it. Thank you. Congressman, as a follow-up to, to uh, Tim's question, we, we've heard some discussion of uh, triggers for a public option. Is, is that something that you would support in lieu of a public option, triggers down the road, if, if, the, uh, if the insurance companies do not, uh, uh, if they do not become more competitive amongst each other? Would, would, you, uh, would you support a, going to some kind of a, yeah. a trigger mechanism here? Yeah, I would. I mean, I think it's a it's public option, um, if not a trigger several years down the line. And then if, if the savings aren't there, the trigger signals a, a public option, then goes into place, um, or a co-op. So, you know, all of those, I think, at some point give us some more choice. But, you know, I think a trigger would be fine. And I think there, there's more uh, debate going on about that in the Senate right now. You know, as the gentleman said earlier, the student who, who spoke up, yeah, we have 60 votes, but, you know, we have uh, Democratic senators from Nebraska, for example, from New Orleans, very conservative Democrats who, you know, I mean, when you take a moderate Republican and conservative Democrat, there's not a whole lot of difference um, between the two. So those are the people that are going to be debating, I think, the trigger, the co-op, exactly what form this takes. Nancy Himes. Nancy, would you go to a microphone, please? Nancy is a registered nurse. She lives in Girard. She's concerned about veterans and the health care that is or is not provided for their families. Nancy, your question, please. My question is that all veterans retired and disabled, will they be able to have free insurance for themselves and their family and their children because of what they've done for us to keep us free? They will continue to be able to access the veterans health care system that they have. Um, and we actually, la I think a year or two ago, we put the greatest increase in the history of the VA into veterans health care benefits because we had all these Persian Gulf um, people coming online from 91 and then the, the latest in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so we made a significant investment into veterans health care and we will continue to do so. But this plan would be for everyone for their families, for people who may not be able to access the veterans care, who have nowhere else to go. That's what this plan ideally is about. Well, I did have a question also, <clears throat> and those families there, would they be able to get free insurance? A lot of times the wives are not able to work because they have to stay home with their husbands and take care of them. If they're not working, they're not able to have insurance. It would depend, under the reform, it would depend on where they fall in the income category. So the, the veteran would be taken care of 
Um, but the spouse and the family now, all of a sudden, they would fall into the, this system, um, which I believe would be much better than the system that we have right now. And if they have, you know, maybe I should talk just a second on how this whole thing's going to be set up. You know, everyone's going to be in on the system now. And there'll be subsidies for people who make families of four who make $88,000 a year or less will qualify for a credit, a health care credit or a subsidy that will help them pay for their health care. So this person, depending on how much they were getting an income a year, if they would fall into that category under the $88,000 a year, they would qualify for a subsidy. Um, we will bump Medicaid up to 133% of poverty and strengthen it and give it more you know, prescription drugs and it, it would become better care. Um, so that will go up and then from 133% up, up to about 400% of poverty, which is $40,000 a year for one person or 88 for a family then you would qualify for a credit. So this person presumably would fall into that category where he or she would then you know, have some of their health care taken care of. Thank you, Nancy. And, and we can get into the, more of the details of the, you know, of the plan as we, as we chat. OK. If that's OK. Bob. That's fine. Okay. We, we have some time. Is Kathy Bergdorf with us tonight? Kathy? Kathy is owner of a health care business yeah. in Youngstown. Hi. She's for less government involvement and wants people to take their insurance with them when they change jobs. Kathy, your question, please. Yes. Um, we own a local business, and really we're dealing with the top five leading causes of death. Um, as of January 1st, Medicare is proposing a 21% cut in reimbursement in those categories, and actually in cardiac and pulmonary, it's a 70% cut. Wouldn't you consider that rationing of care, kind of like you were talking about the insurance company? If you have diabetes, we're not going to take you. Because really, the hospitals and the physicians wouldn't be able to provide that care. You know, it costs more to drive to work than the reimbursement we're going to receive. So wouldn't you consider that rationing? Well, any system, there is some rationing whether it's under the current insurance. I mean, you can't cover every single solitary thing. Um, that's just not feasible. It's not, you know, it just can't happen. That particular cut that you're talking about, um, we are going to fix. And we recognize that a lot of people have been taking a beating on Medicare reimbursements. Um, and so that is something that needs, needs to get fixed. Um, but Medicare in general under this plan is going to get a lot stronger because we're going to, first of all, have a healthier, if everyone's covered, this is what a lot of seniors have been scared on this one, too. They say, well, we're going to have cuts in Medicare. Okay, so seniors say, oh, my God, you're going to cut my benefits. There are going to be savings in Medicare. And the problem we have now that's really driving up the cost of Medicare is we have, especially around here, we have a lot of people that are 50, 55, 60 years old, have lost their jobs and have lost their health care. And we had, you know, we were doing these telephone town halls. We probably had 30,000 people on three of these calls. But I remember one lady in particular. She was 60 years old. She made $32,000 a year. She had health care, but her, her employer just got rid of it. And she said, I can't afford my health care. She makes $32,000 a year. She said, I'm just going to wait until I get into Medicare. And we have thousands and thousands and thousands of people across our country who are getting close to Medicare age, who will not buy health insurance or have bad health insurance. They can't access prevention and all that, those good things. So they go into the Medicare program much sicker than they actually need to be because they don't have this care. So by having a healthier person, because under our plan, everybody will have coverage, by having a healthier person going into the Medicare program, that will strengthen Medicare, that will save us a lot of money, and that will allow us to help with a lot of the reimbursements that people are concerned about. So are you saying January 1st, the physicians and other ancillary providers were, were not going to be cut somewhere between 21 and 70 percent then? Again, I don't say anything's 100 mm percent -hmm. because that's not a smart thing to do. <laughs> but um, yes, we, we have this problem every year where we have these 
cuts that are coming down the pike and we end up fixing them, whether it's with physicians or providers, whoever, wherever the case may be. So there will be some fix. I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be, but it won't be 21%. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Kathy. Congressman, along that same line, talking about Medicare, the latest projections that I've seen over the weekend was that uh, it's projected that, that Medicare will be belly up or close to belly up in the year 2017, which to my way of thinking is awfully soon. Uh, the savings that you were talking about to Kathy, mm -hmm. are, would those kick in soon enough to help alleviate the, the, the shortfall for Medicare? Yes, um, because, I mean, people, obviously, as soon as we start this, people will immediately start getting care and then start getting into Medicare a little bit uh, healthier. But there are also other savings that we're going to get. We had, just with Medicare Advantage, which we are not getting rid of, but we had 107, we were going to save $117 billion just on overpayments on Medicare. Medicare, there's a lot of wasteful spending in Medicare. So we don't necessarily have to cut benefits, but what we do have to do is figure out where a lot of this waste is coming from. And we'll be, we will be able to do that rather quickly with this health care reform bill, and then that will extend the life. I think it's projected at least five more years um, into Medicare. So, but I can't, you can't underestimate the significance of all of a sudden you have thousands, today you have thousands of people going into the Medicare program who wait to get their hip operation, wait to get their heart surgery, wait to get anything significant done because they know Medicare is going to pay for it. And all of a sudden, those people, and, and if you do that, you become chronically ill. And so now Medicare has to deal with people who are really, really much sicker than they needed to be. And through this reform, we'll be able to put a healthier customer, a healthier patient into the Medicare program. And that's going to extend the life. Okay. Thank you. We have a question brought to us via Facebook. Uh, Deb Lavelle sends us this question. Congressman, if health insurance becomes mandatory, how will people making 8 to $10 an hour afford it if there is no public option to make a competitive market? Well, first of all, I think there's, there's some confusion that the public option would only be where poor people or people who have lesser means would go. The public option would be for everybody. Um, here's basically what's going to happen. We're going to set up an exchange, basically a supermarket, where you can go and all of the private insurers can go and participate in this market. And they, what we're going to do is set up a panel, not a death panel, but a, I'm afraid to even use the word panel anymore, um, uh, headed by the Surgeon General with health care providers, docs, who will set up what's called the Essential Benefits Package. And so no matter what private insurer goes into this exchange or the public option, they will all have this essential benefits package, which will be basic care headed up by the Surgeon General. So dental, eye, maternity, hospital visits, prevention, those kinds of things. So whoever goes to the marketplace, like this gentleman wants to do, there will be an essential benefits package. And the public option, should it survive, would just compete with all of these other private options um, as well. But there would be a baseline of coverage. So the public option isn't just where certain people would go. Anyone could buy to go to the public option um, if they wanted to. Now, somewhat, there will be exemptions for people who just flat out don't make enough money and for whatever reason, for, for some extraordinary circumstance, can't get in. But that person would either qualify for Medicaid, which would be up to 133% of poverty, or once Medicaid ends, then they would be heavily subsidized to go out and purchase care. So that person will be able to access coverage, but they will have to get into the system. At some, at some point, they will have to get coverage, and it will be subsidized, and they will be able to afford it. Now, here's also what's going to be a benefit to everybody. If that person today doesn't have health insurance, they make 8 to 10 bucks an hour, they don't have a health insurance plan. They get sick, they wait, they wait, they wait, they hope their cold goes away. They end up in the emergency room. They end up in the emergency room for a long time. 
and you can talk to local hospitals here and they will tell you the amount of charity care they have to provide. That person pays nothing now. Under our plan, that person will A, have to get coverage, they will get subsidized, but they will have a copay. They will have a premium that they have to pay. They will have skin in the game, okay? Because everyone's got to part. If we're going to do this, everyone's got to participate. So although there will be subsidies for this person because we want to incentivize it for them to get health care, they will still have something that they have to come out of pocket with. Where will those subsidies come from? They will be paid for by one is the savings that we're going to have in Medicare. There will be a surcharge, well, and, and this is all going to be debatable and negotiated out, but there will be a surcharge on uh, families who make more than a million dollars a year will have to pay 0.9% of their income. So a household making a million dollars would pay about $9,000 a year. There would be um, people who make 350000 or more would have to pay some as well. And that's where the money would come from, plus the savings in Medicare and some other things. But now all of a sudden we have a group of people, 30 million, there's all kinds of different numbers for you know, uh, how many uninsured there are. But these people will now be contributing to some extent to their own health care coverage. So we'll be getting some money from them as well. Okay. Next I'd like to call on Bob Schroeder, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Humility of Mary Healthcare System. Uh, the Congressman just mentioned uh, a moment ago, Bob, about the, the, the millions of dollars that, that hospitals provide in charity care. Uh, in HMMP's case last year, how much, how much did HM, HMHP uh, give in free care to this community? About $45 million. And that's an actual cost. So that's the cost of providing the service. If you look at charges, it was well over $80 million. So I'm going to kind of stick to the same theme a little bit and kind of incorporate some of the things that we've just been talking about. And that is when, and again, remember this is from a hospital um, administration perspective. When I look at um, Medicare and Medicaid, they pay hospitals below the cost. Um, Medicaid pays hospitals about 70% of cost. Medicare about 85% of cost. And again, this is cost, not charges. There's a concern on the provider point of view that a public plan or even a cooperative plan will pay similar, you know, somewhere between Medicare and Medicaid, um, you know, some fraction of cost, which then means that the difference between the cost to somebody in a pu public plan would have to be passed on to commercial payers which is then going to make that differential between the commercial payers and the public or cooperative plans even greater, which will eventually drive out the commercial um, plans altogether. Uh, I was just wondering what your perspective of that and what you see in the health care reform bill that could potentially stop that from happening. Well, the House bill has um, two, there have been two approaches. One was for the public option, the reimbursement would be Medicare plus 5%. So it would actually be an increase for you. That was amended to, I believe it, it's Medicare, from Medicare plus 5 up to um, the highest private insurance reimbursement in that region, I think okay. is how it ended up. Now again, this is all you know, going to be negotiated. I don't know if it will be exactly one of those or not. But in both instances in the House bill, you'll at the very least get Medicare plus 5%. A follow-up, Bob? <laughs> well, can I switch subjects a little bit? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, defensive medicine obviously also drives up the cost, and you were talking about a lot of waste in the system, and I think there is a lot of waste in, in the system because of defensive medicine, and I was just wondering your perspective of health care reform trying to deal with that issue. You know, I, I know this isn't very popular necessarily among Democrats, but I believe that we need to address the issues of defensive medicine and the issues of liability. Uh, I just think there, I've talked to too many doctors who have said to me they do tests because they fear that they may get a lawsuit and they didn't cover their own rear ends. And so I think we've got to be able to work something out um, with 
the lawyers and the docs to where we can all agree this can't, you know, we can't let this prevent health care reform from happening to where a group of cardiologists, there's got to be a standard of care. Now, we're not saying protect the surgeon that amputates the wrong leg and, and all of a sudden the consumer now or the patient is, is going to get punished because now they had both legs amputated and they have no recourse in the courts. But what we should say is if we have 10 cardiologists who, given this situation, all do the same thing, and this is the proper way to address whatever the situation that they have to deal with, and that particular cardiologist who's being accused of whatever had went through all of the details and did everything that everyone else would have done, there should be something in the law that allows that, that doc to be comfortable. You know, practicing medicine is an art. It's not a science all the time. It's feeling your way through things. And I think if you take that away from the doctor, I think you're taking some of the magic out of the doctor-patient relationship. And I think that needs to be protected. So I know President Obama kind of tipped his hat a little bit, too, to um, being open to some conversation about this. And I think it's doable. I think this is something that we can do. And I, and I hope we do, because I don't want to see, I don't think any one issue is big enough to prevent health care reform from happening. It's just too important. Is Paul Rainey with us? Paul, would you go to the microphone, please? Paul was retired from Youngstown. He thinks that health care is too expensive, and he thinks that tort reform should be included in the health care reform. Paul? Uh, yes, Congressman. Uh, we just spoke a little bit about defensive medicine, and uh, wouldn't it be quicker and simpler to fix that than passing health care reform? Well, different studies have, have said that medical malpractice it has some impact um, on cost, but the, more about maybe it, it's hard to quantify what defensive medicine is. It's hard, to, it's hard to get your finger on how many tests a certain doc does. But I don't think you're going to find the level of savings in the healthcare system just by doing tort reform. I think it's just too complicated to say what, there's one silver bullet here that's going to just make everything else go away. I understand that, but wouldn't it be simpler? Wouldn't that reform be simpler than health care reform? <laughs> well, nothing's simple in Washington, let me well, tell you. Well, we know that. Uh, <laughs> we know that. Nothing's simple. Um, so it, it will be, I think it will be, end up being a part of all this, you know? And is it simpler on its own rather than dealing with the whole system? Yeah, it probably is. But the, all of these issues. Um, get kind of dicey as we go through them, and that's why it's taken a while. That's why this has been going on since, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and then Franklin Roosevelt, and then, you know, we just, we're, we're going through this because it's so complicated and there's so many, you know, nuances to this process. So I think tort reform will end up being, being a piece of it, and it's something that I think needs to be included. Could I ask you one other question? Uh, ask him. <laughs> he, he's the boss. Uh, you made a comment about the tremendous increase y'all gave to the VA. And I get treatment at the VA, and I thank God for that. But why do we pay more for a prescription at the VA than those horrible business people charge out there in the open market? Well, part of the, just in, in general with the VA structure, although we did make this tremendous increase, we have tremendous pressure being put on the VA because of our returning soldiers who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's... Yeah, it's this was before Iraq. Well, it's, <laughs> diffi it's difficult to keep up. I, I can't speak specifically to your... Um, I know veterans health care is better than a lot of people get. I'm sure it's not perfect, but if you have... I have a no complaints about it. Okay. I, I just wonder why we have to pay more than for some prescriptions your, than there is on the open market. What's your copay? Uh, $8 a month. Walmart advertises $4 a month every day. All right, well, we'll get to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Question I have, and I, I think Paul alluded to it, was, you know, in the debate on health care reform, health care insurance reform, just about everything we've heard up to this point has been one plan to fix it all. Is, is that the right approach we need to be thinking, or is there anything wrong with thinking about 
let's, let's fix one thing at a time as opposed to a, uh, an all-encompassing omnibus bill that uh, is, is all or nothing. Well, it's, it's gotten whittled down, I think, from where it originally started. So I think the, the legislative process usually begins where you talk about everything that you possibly need to do in health care reform or any other piece of legislation. And then it goes through the committee process and slowly gets widowed down to something that everyone can kind of get their arms around and what makes sense. The problem is um, with health care is that there's so many different things that need to get done. We need to address pre-existing conditions. We need to address liability. We need to address reimbursements. We need to address um, universal coverage because we're dumping people into our emergency rooms and it's costing hospitals a lot of money. So you can go right through the line here, Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare Part D with the prescription drugs. I mean, there's so many issues here that there are some fundamental reforms, I think, that we want to achieve with this, um, this reform bill that we're pushing here. And I think if you don't take care of some fundamental things, you're not going to be able to bend the cost curve. And the key here is bending the cost curve. We have, we have health care costs are growing at 9%. Okay, Our GDP is growing at 3%. So you start playing that out for 10 more years, one out of every five, and this is the chart here, one, by 2018, you see the graph, this is national health care spending as part of the GDP. By 2018, 20%, one of, out of every $5 we spend in this country will be spent on health care. You take that out another 20 years, one out of every $3 is going to be spent on health care. That is unsustainable for us as a country. Unsustainable. It will collapse our economy. It's already having tremendous effects. So if we don't have a reform bill that helps bend that cost curve a little bit, reduce the cost for small business, reduce the cost for families, then you know, it's really not worth doing. I mean, it would have some benefit, but overall, it wouldn't do what we need it to do. A piecemeal approach to health care reform won't fly? I, I don't think so. I mean, we've, we've got some fundamental things we need to take care of, and I think this is our time, and, you know, we can't shy away from this. Yes, it's big. This is a big deal. This is, this is health care reform in the United States of America, but we can't be afraid of it. We've, we've got to do this. This, this, is, this, again, it's unsustainable for us to continue to go down the same road. If we do nothing, a family of four next year will pay $1,800 a year more in health care insurance, in health insurance. And then the next year, you'll pay another $1,800 or $2,000. And then the next year, this is compounding. This isn't, it's $1,800 and it goes away. This just keeps adding up and adding up and adding up. And so if, you're, if you have insurance now and you're lucky enough to where your employer says, you know, you, I'm, you know, I'll pay 90, you pay 10, or I'll pay 80, you pay 20, that ain't going on forever. They're going to start, and people have already felt this, they're going to start coming to you. Here's a, I don't want to get too much into the charts, but if you look at to, there's been a 119% increase in what employers have had to contribute since 1999. So if they're not passing it on to you yet, that yet, they're still eating the cost. And we need small businesses to not be spending so much money on health care. We want them reinvesting back into their business, hiring people, buying a new machine, investing in the new technology, training their workers, giving their workers higher wages. This has been part of the problem why wages have been stagnant over the last decade or so. Because health care has been eating up so much. So we've got to have a reform that bends that cost curve and allows these businesses to reinvest back into their, their own businesses and their workers. We're going to go back to our audience now. John Breedlove, if you're here, would you go to the microphone, please? John is a college student from Austintown. John thinks that Medicare and Medicaid are disasters waiting to bankrupt America, and the government has a track record of making things, of making things more involved. I'm not sure what that says. <laughs> okay, I was going to start off with a quote uh, by Milton Friedman, he's an economist. Well, we know um, where you're coming from then. What? <laughs> we'll know where you're coming from then. Okay. If you put the federal government in charge of the Sahara Desert, there would be a shortage of sand within five years. History has proven this assessment of the government correct as the government's solutions create tomorrow's problems. Today, for example, few from my generation believe that they're going to get uh, any payment from Social Security, you know, Medicare is bankrupt, and basically everything that you propose is a burden on my generation. 
So, uh, you know, with that, uh, what would cause you to actually believe that the government can be, you know, the engine for solutions rather than the free market? Well, uh, first let me say that those of you who know Milton Friedman, he was uh, pretty much responsible for the supply side economic policies that got us into the situation we're in economically in the first place. Um, and, and uh, you know, it, it, was, it was that philosophy that said, you know, cut taxes on the wealthiest, you know, people and put a lot of money into defense spending and, you know, everything else will take care of itself, things will trickle down. And that's what we did during the last administration. And, you know, people ask, how are you going to pay for health care? The Bush tax cuts cost $2.5 trillion over 10 years. And what we're proposing here is $900, $900 billion over 10 years. So if we have them for tax cuts for wealthy people, I think we should be able to prioritize and say these are good investments for average Americans. So enough about Milton Friedman. Um, we, we have a health care crisis. I'm sure you're not proposing getting rid of Medicare, because that you, you, cert, you are? Yeah. OK, well, he's, you can tell he's young. He's, uh, <laughs> But <laughs> you're going to have people, uh, you better get out of here. We've got to get some security for this fellow. Um, which I think is a reasonable, I would rather have this discussion with you coming from a philosophical standpoint than the nonsense we had about death panels and everything else. I think this is an honest discussion here. But I would say that this isn't about the government taking over things. This, in this whole discussion, this is about the relationship government has to the free market. A pure free market, and you may believe that a pure free market would, would work. I don't. And that the free market has holes in it. And the government has responded to those holes in the free market. The fr free market could be pretty cruel. And we saw over the course of the last century, when we had worker rights, a 40-hour work week, um, National Labor Relations Act, the National Labor Relations Board, all of these things that would protect workers. Then there was uh, Social Security, because we needed to make sure that our seniors had some dignity. Then there was a hole in the insurance system, because it's really not in anybody's profit motive to cover an older person who's getting sick. And so we needed to put Medicare in there so that senior citizens would have some level of health care, because the free market didn't take care of those things. So the government was in response to that. So the discussion we're having now is a discussion about where, where does the government belong in relation to what the capitalistic system, and in this instance, the insurance uh, system, is, is doing in a, in a capitalistic system. So what we're saying is that the government is not taking this thing over. There are already insurance regulations. They're just done by the state, the Department of Insurance in the state of Ohio. They all have state-run uh, regulators. But what we're saying is that it is a values issue for us that someone who works hard and has insurance and gets sick and then they lose their insurance or lose their job and try to go out into the free private market now to try to get health insurance and they say we will not cover you because you have diabetes or we will not cover you because you had cancer we know it's gone but it hasn't been gone for 10 years yet we're not going to cover you so we're coming together as a country, and some people obviously disagree with this, but we're saying we need to come together as a country and say our values as a country is, to a certain extent, be our brother's keeper and say that is inhumane, it's cruel, it's wrong, and insurance companies shouldn't be making money on the backs of denying people these, this coverage. So the government and the people, through the elections, spoke to say we want health care reform. It was a big issue during the uh, last election. And so it's not a government takeover. It's saying, where does government need to come in to provide some consumer protections? And that's what we want to do. We want to say that you can't be denied coverage because of a pre-existing condition. We're saying that it will be limited to how much you can spend a year out of pocket for your own health care. Because just in our district last year, and you're Austin Town, so you, you live in, in the 17th district. 1,600 families went bankrupt last year because of health care. 1,600 of our neighbors, our friends, went bankrupt 
That's wrong. I'm sorry. I'm going to say it right here on that. I, that's wrong. It should not happen in America. And if the government has to have some role in regulating that, then I believe that's an appropriate role for government to have. And also to help subsidize and make people afford it and take a role in helping bend the cost curve. So we went from Milton Friedman to that. How about that? <laughs> John, thank you. Did you have a follow-up? Oh, yeah. I actually, well, first of all, I was going to rebut that a little bit. Go ahead. Um, Actually, when the government gets involved with the economy, there's, there tends to be distortions, and that, that's why we could uh, blame the government for the current economic crisis with Freddie May, or Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Well, see, I would, I would answer the question with, under the current economic problem was that there wasn't enough government regulation of Wall Street, and that's what happened. We had people selling these mortgages, and they, they, we, needed, we needed more regulation. Of, of Wall Street to protect the investors. And I would so, you know, but this is, and I want to congratulate you. You're in high school? I'm in college. In college, yeah, you have a lot of guts for standing up here, and I, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but this is an honest discussion. This is not, this was not August. This is September discussion. So I appreciate it. Okay. Thank um, you, John. Also, there's a shortage of doctors. Are there, you know, that could be a cause uh, for the increase in costs, what would you do to address this? Well, we ha in this bill, too, we put a significant amount of money into education. I mean, in addition to what we've done, we put about $15 billion into Pell Grants. We have a $2,500 American Opportunity tax credit for college. Um, so we've already invested just generally in, in education. But in this bill, we have a significant amount of money um, authorized for more docs, more nurses, more healthcare professionals. Because in essence, what we're doing, we're going to take 30 or 40 million, whatever the number may be, million people are now not going to be going in emergency rooms when they need to. They're going to need to go to you know, family docs for prevention. So we are going to need more. And that's why in this bill, we, we help fund a lot of that stuff. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. I'd like to call on. Uh, Dr. Tom Boniface, who is an orthopedic surgeon with uh, Neo UCOM, is uh, our experts here to uh, ask questions of the congressman. Tom, thanks for being with us. Uh, my pleasure. I'm not sure I'm necessarily any, any more expert uh, than other people here. We all have our issues, and they're all valid and they're all very important. I, I may have a different perspective uh, than some based on who I am and what I do, but I. I don't want to stand here pretending to be an expert. I am standing here, though, as a physician. I am standing here as a owner of a small business. I employ, with other partners, approximately 60 people. I'm standing here as a father who has children, and I pay health care premiums for my employees and my family. I've seen my premiums go up. What I get for those premiums goes down. And what I get as a provider to provide those services has gone down. You can't answer this question, but fundamentally, where's the money going? That's, I think, the biggest concern, and we're all sharing that. There's been a lot of things that have been proposed, a lot of very well-reasoned arguments from both sides of the aisle. And I think both sides of the aisle need to be heard on all of these things. My question, though, of you, Congressman, is this. As a physician, when I prescribe a medication or recommend a treatment, it is supposed to be evidence-based, and that means that I have to have scientific evidence that this has been done before, it's been compared to other forms of treatment, and it's going to be safe and effective, safe especially. The side effects are worth the risks that I prescribe. You and President Obama are trying to write a prescription for our country in a time of need. I think we can all agree on that. We are in a time of need. The question is where to go. What evidence do you have that your prescription is both safe and effective for what you propose to do for the problems that we have. I will uh, say this. First, we're in agreement that we have a problem. Yes. I think we're all in agreement of that. We spend, in the United States, almost twice as much as other countries spend per person on health care. And yet, major health care indicators, we fall below these other countries. So we're obviously not spending our money very wisely if you know, we're not 
Uh, and here, here's the last chart. You can see it goes from Australia, Austria, Canada, Ireland, Italy, Japan. And the blue line down at the bottom is United States, $6,500 uh, a year in 06. And again, that's, that's going significantly up. So I'm not saying that the evidence that we're basing it on is not we're going to run the Canada system, because that is not what's on the table here. We're not going to run the German system. That's not what's on the table here. But what we're saying is part of how these countries save a lot of money is they cover everybody. And that is a significant savings for us. So, and I, you know, it goes back to what our grandparents said. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we see it all the time with charity care, where you know folks show up at the emergency room sick. We see it in the Medicare program, where people get into the Medicare program sick. So I think one of the fundamental issues that I think there's a significant amount of evidence on is that if people have preventative health care, they cost less. People who don't smoke, for example, have lower rates of heart disease, I mean, and lung cancer, and all these things. So I think there's significant evidence for those kinds of things. And at the end of the day, that's really what the, the crux of this whole argument is. I mean, should everybody be covered, and will that significantly save us some money? You're talking, though, when it comes to things like smoking and obesity. You've read Michael Pollan. You obviously understand. I mean, he's a brilliant writer, by the way, and I would recommend anybody to read his books to deal with the uh, eating issues we have in this country. A third of our population is obese. Fifty percent are overweight. People smoke. People drive their cars without seat belts. People do lots of things that are not in their best interest on their own. This is human behavior. How do you legislate that? How, do, how are you going to legislate away obesity? Well, I mean, if you look at what's happened, some of it's legislative, some of it's through other means in our system, but we start making people wear seat belts, and so that's had a significant effect. Um, we have started the Surgeon General, you know, it took a while, but we obviously started telling people smoking was bad. We had to drag the cigarette companies before Congress, where they lied and said they weren't spiking tobacco with nicotine, and they were. That was that was our legislative process at work. And they got the, their pants suit off them, and you know, they got hurt by the whole ordeal. Are you and, saying you're going to do that to Chicken McNuggets next? You <laughs> well, mentioned that earlier. I'm not going to do anything. But <laughs> I think what I mentioned earlier, and, and that has reduced the amount of smoking because it became a national priority. We all know, no matter how much common sense it took, that if you inhale smoke, that at some level that's going to be bad for you and it's going to cost our whole system money. So we fixed it. What we're saying here is we have very similar problems. And I'll mention, you know, and it was actually Michael Pollan who wrote about, imagine the insurance companies, it all of a sudden becomes profitable for insurance companies to make sure that their people are healthy, the people they cover are healthy. I think that's significant. It goes back to some free market annex. I mean, this is, this is, it will be profitable for them. It will be in their interest to promote wellness programs in schools and to have incentives for their people to, uh, to uh, participate in wellness programs and exercise programs. And you know, you'll see them naming you know, weight rooms and you know, treadmills and things you know, because it will become significantly, and it could be transformational because it will be in their, their interest. And we all know that the profit motive does work. And so there's evidence there as well. Well, I wish you well in your efforts. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Ann Kurz. Ann, if you would go to the microphone. Ann is a retired teacher and librarian from Canfield. She supports a public option to compete with the private insurance companies and says we need lower premiums and deductibles for employer-provided health care plans. Your question, Ann? Thank you, and thank you for calling on me. Could you get a little closer was, to the microphone, please? Yes. I was uh, getting a little tired sitting there, <laughs> so it, it feels good to be up and moving again. Uh, my question is this, Congressman Ryan. What, in addition, would you say to extremists on both sides of this issue, particularly your colleagues in Congress, and if you can influence anyone in the Senate, that would help too, in, as a representative. What would you say to them, in addition, to help them support health care reform, health insurance reform, right now? We don't get these opportunities very often to have this kind of 
significant change and, and make health care a human right. These opportunities don't come along. And it's obviously very difficult. You know, uh, President Obama tried to learn from President Clinton's mistakes. President Clinton came with a very detailed plan to Congress and said, here's what I want. And guys who had been in Congress for a long, long time said, did this guy just tell us he, this is what he wants? You know, we're gonna, we have a say in this whole deal, too. And so Congress got a hold of it. And it died. And so President Obama came and said, I'm going to lay out some parameters and you know, let the Congress kind of work out the details. And then that kind of left it too ambiguous to where people could start calling, saying death panels are in it and federal funding for abortion and euthanasia and all this crazy stuff that's not in there. And now he has been able to reclaim it. And I think that all of these people that I met at the Canfield Fair, at the St. Matthias Slovak uh, you know, Festival and the uh, Warren Italian Festival in Briar Hill, um, I put on 10 pounds in August, okay, just going to the festivals. But all of these people recognize that they need help and these opportunities don't come along all that often. And so if there's one thing I can say to, to my colleagues is, let's take our time. We don't have to force this down anybody's throat. Let's do this right. Let's be responsible. Let's get consensus. Um, this doesn't have to be left or right. This needs to be something that's going to help American people. And I think we're getting close to that. And I think we're getting real close to that. And I think we need the one thing is, this is the time to do it. Thank you. I was one of those people at the Campfield Fair, and we collected 1,400 signatures for you. And I would like to present them to you tonight at some right. point. Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Ann. Thank you. Maria Saletti. Maria is a registered nurse and medical administrator from Niles. She feels that insurance companies have too much power over who gets care and what it costs. Your question, please. Hi, Tim. Um, originally, my question was about the public option and what effect it was going to have on the commercial insurers. Right now, they kind of regulate who gets care and who doesn't. Um, having a public option, how is that going to affect it, affect the commercial insurers? Is it going to put the brakes on some of that? Well, I don't know if the public option would as much as the insurance reforms would. The public option, I think, would help control some costs. Um, because the, the, the idea with the public option, as I said, there's going to be this supermarket, this exchange where all these private insurers can go, and they're going to have all these different plans. There'll be the essential benefit package, which everyone has to offer. But then they can offer premium plans, Cadillac plans, you know, really high-end health care if, if people want that. All of those can be offered, and the public you know, plan uh, would compete with that. And the idea is that the public plan is not going to have to pay their CEO $150,000 a day or an hour or whatever it is they're making these days. I mean, there's significant money that goes to CEOs. There's a significant amount of money that they spend on advertising. There's a significant amount of spending that, that the private insurers do that a public option wouldn't have to. So that would bring down, that would compete with them and it would br help bring down some of the costs is the idea because they wouldn't be spending money on all these other things. So it would, it would help with costs, but I don't think the public option would necessarily help, the reforms would help on the other side of saying you can't deny pre-existing conditions, you can't, you know, there's only so much you can spend a year, all of those kinds of things. But it wouldn't put them out of business is what I'm saying. Putting They're, private insurance, it wouldn't put, no, it would not put private insurance out okay. of business. The Congressional Budget Office did a study and they said in the next, in 10 years from now, only about 10 to 12 million people would actually go and access the public option. And the Congressional Budget Office is sometimes, it's, it's a, uh, very critical of both parties' uh, ideas. So it's, it's nonpartisan, it beats Democrats up, it beats Republicans up. But in their analysis, they said in 10 years, 10 to 12 million people would then go to the, would probably be in the public option. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Kim Zeidenstein. Kim is an occupational therapist from Boardman. She supports health care for pre existing conditions and thinks that health care needs to be more affordable. Kim? Thank you. 
Congressman Ryan. Oh, I'm, good, Mike. oh okay. Um, my question uh, is really about home care, and I provide home care. I've done 28 years as an occupational therapist, and I provided all arenas, but one area that I found to be the most cost effective is home care. And as earlier someone mentioned, Medicare is looking to cut that again in January. And I was wondering how health care reform might look at home care and explain if there would be any um, additional reasoning not to keep it in the health care reform. Well, again, I think we will take care of that cut that is proposed. I think every year I've been in Congress, there's been a proposed cut, and whether it's physicians or whatnot, we ended up fixing it. Um, not always to everybody's satisfaction, but um, this is a reason why we have to have health care reform, so we're not doing patchwork every single year. But I think home care needs to be a, a part of this because there are significant savings uh, when you go to home care and you take people out of hospitals and different nursing homes or whatever the case may be where you can treat them at home and, and reduce a lot of the overhead cost. And I think as we get into this, again, the insurance companies and I think people will start to gravitate towards home health care more so than they are now, and I think there will be reimbursements to back that up and support that. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. We're going to take a, another question from Facebook. And this is uh, from Buffy Balog, who works for a dentist in Bourbon. Will this plan weed out smaller medical and dental practices, or will it actually help them? Well, it'll actually help them. I think th there's going to be there's going to be another 30 or 40 million people who will be uh, accessing the health care system and you know in the essential essential benefits package will be dental so you know Dennis uh, again and I think there's some money in here to help uh, train and, and educate Dennis too so Dennis will be they'll be fine they're gonna they're gonna have a lot more customers okay thank you Buzz Pishker is the CEO of Forum Health if uh, Buzz would go to a microphone now. We'll call on him to uh, have a question for Congressman Ryan. Buzz, thank thanks you. for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, obviously, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's nice of you to do this this evening. And I guess I can say on behalf of the people at Forum Health, uh, health care workers, hospitals want to care for people. I, I think that's a given. So that's kind of the, the basis for my question. I'd also s suggest that some would argue that every, every, everybody currently has health care today, they just use the emergency room right. versus the standard process. Uh, but my question's more into funding. Um, I, I think you've been very articulate on the fact that as we have more people in the system using health care, there'll be more need for family care physicians, et cetera. That makes sense and I, and I think it is appropriate. How does that then play into the situation and how we fund the hospital world, uh, which I live in now, as far as how we're going to make, um, how are we going to allow the hospitals to be more financially solvent and to meet the needs? Because obviously with additional need for health care, more service, more service given in preventive and creative ways versus the more acute ways coming through the emergency room, how do you see that playing out? Well, I think family docs, obviously, outside of the hospital realm are going to be a lot more prominent, a lot more busy. Um, but what we would like to do with docs and, and try to do and model what's happening, and, and some of the local hospitals are already doing this, uh, is to figure out how we can reduce the overutilization of hospitals and make sure that you know, we don't take care of people and they leave and then they come back. And I think that starts with getting creative and incentivizing a relationship between the hospital and the doctor. And that's what's included in this bill, um, is to have these different uh, care organizations that will um, do a couple of different things, but try to incentivize doctors and hospitals working together on the patient, like they do at the Mayo Clinic and some other areas around the country. Then also, there's another idea of bundling payments where, you know, the docs and the hospitals work together and we just pay the hospitals and you guys, you know, work everything out to make sure that everybody's working on the same page. But I don't think there's any, again, one silver bullet here. And I think as we have a universal system, you know, we need to learn from local hospitals as to what's working, what's saving money, what's reducing costs. Uh Two things uh, that come to mind as I hear that is, number one, do you envision then more uh, employed doctors by a hospital? 
uh, versus the more independent uh, model? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I would imagine um, as far as emergency rooms, there, there may be less, but uh, as far as the preventative aspects, it depends on what the hospital does. Every hospital does, they all do different things, but it depends on how people make their way maybe to the hospital through the, the family care system that's in place. But I think, I think everything's going to change. I mean, I think because of the, the transformational effect that I think will happen when insurance companies get involved in wellness, who knows how that plays out and how, what the hospital's roles will be. I, I'm not exactly sure. Okay, so that's not really something that we've really got to in, 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 in as we've approached this bill in your mind? No. Okay, so that's, some, that's something that's in the future that needs to be worked out. I think. The, the one follow-up question I would have is, the other thing that has impacts on viability of acute care hospitals is um, competition uh, from uh, hospitals and uh, centers, surgery centers, et cetera, that mm -hmm. basically handpick their cases and mm -hmm. don't provide services that other, that, that a not-for-profit must take and those kind of things. Is there anything going to be addressed in this bill or coming forward that you think will adjust that situation? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. There will be some physician-owned hospital reform. I don't know if there'll be an outright ban or if there'll be, you know, again, this is in the process here, um, to where I think a lot of hospitals will be grandfathered in who have already set themselves up. But as on a go-forward basis, I think there will probably be a ban or a limitation to how much a certain physician can own of a physician-owned hospital. And, you know, maybe that physician-owned hospital has to do some charity care, which not sure how that's going to work out if we have everyone covered anyway. So I think all these things need to be worked out. But I think there's a general consensus that, that there will be something done and there will probably be some limitation, if not an outright ban on it. Okay, because as you know, those facilities become the thing that's the, the, the right. safety net for the, a lot of our, our citizens when they're in time of peril. Right. Again, thank you very much uh, for your time and the thank opportunity. You. Thank you. Thank you, Buzz. Kelly Hall. Kelly, if you would go to the microphone. Kelly's a bookkeeper from Niles. Pharmacy and insurance companies are enjoying too much profit and health care is simply too expensive. Kelly, your question, please. Hi, my question is, as a family of four earning about 42000 a year, what would they expect to pay monthly for subsidized insurance if the public option is there? Well, again, I mean, you wouldn't, if, there, if the public option was there, um, it, that's not the only thing that's going to get subsidized. All of these other private insurance plans will get, uh, it will be based on you and your income. And then you'll get the subsidy and you'll be able to go to the supermarket and pick which one you want. So if people are saying that we're gonna, you're going to limit our freedom, you're going to limit our choice. That's not what's happening at all. You're going to be empowered to go to a marketplace that has greater competition. And so you will get the subsidy based on your income. I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but I would say the, the, the top out where it completely phases out is $88,000 a year for a family of four, I believe, and you would be half of that. So I would think you would, you would receive a significant subsidy to help with your family. On the flip side, what would I expect to pay? Again, all those need to be worked out. You know, I, I, I would be wrong to, to say, but there, there will be a cap as to how much you'll, you'll pay a year. And so what we don't want to happen is your family to go bankrupt because somebody gets sick right. in your family, and we want to make sure that you have health care. I mean, here's the thing. This is going to help people who are working. This is, you know, again, just talking to people around town. We want to help people who are trying their best to make it. And I've had many people come up to me who say, maybe it's just easier for me to go on Medicaid. It's too hard, but I'm, I was taught to work, and there's dignity in work, and I want to work. I want my kids to see me working, not you know, necessarily right. going on Medicaid or going on welfare. But that, and th those are the people that we need to help right now, people who are working and can't afford this. And you are someone who is like that. You will get help. Right. And exactly how much, I don't know, but you would fall into the middle of the subsidy range. So you wouldn't get any, you wouldn't go from nothing and you wouldn't get everything, but you'd be, you'd be somewhere in between. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's the thing, and Buzz, Buzz made a good point too, is that, you know, there is universal health care. And 
people who have insurance now. There's a reason it's going up as high as it's going up. We have these 30 million people go to the emergency room and the hospital doesn't get paid. You know, no one gets paid for this. So it, it ends up when someone goes who has an insurance card, when they go, that those 30 million people are reflected in your health care bill. So we're all paying for this now. What we're saying here is it doesn't, it doesn't it make a lot more sense if we're already paying for this person that we have them pay some, first of all, let them come out of their own pocket a little bit, let them have some skin in the game, that makes sense, and then also um, help them get a prescription drug. Uh, Bob's told me this a million times. Help me give someone a $20 prescription as opposed to them coming to my emergency room a week later and costing me $100,000. We're paying for them already. And so let's, let's be smart about this. And if we're going to pay one way or the other, let's get them the care that they may need beforehand. And it's going to end up saving all of us a lot of money and bend that cost curve. OK, moving on to Beth Dunn. Beth, you go to the microphone, please. Beth is a retail business owner from Poland. Beth supports a single payer system or Medicare and thinks that a public option must be included in the health care bill. Your question, Beth? Uh, my question is that if we have a health care reform bill without a public option, how are we going to make insurance companies put the health of citizens before their profits when actually by law they're required to uh, fill, fulfill their responsibility to their shareholders? And um, how are we going to make this affordable for everybody. We've got a lot of people. 10% of the country is unemployed right now. How are they going to afford health insurance without a public option? Well, again, the, the, the public option is, is not going to reduce anybody's access. You know, we're going to the, there'll be these affordability credits that, that people will get based on their income. And from, again, $88,000 to below, you will get a, uh, some affordability credits to help you pay for this. And you will take those credits and you will go to the supermarket, the healthcare supermarket, and you will then be able to pick which private insurance you want or if the public option stays in there or the public option. So it wouldn't be that they would, if you get the affordability credit, you just can go to the public option. You can go to the private option too, or any of the private options too. So we're increasing choice for people. and. So these people will be able to go there and access whatever they want. The, the, the reason we will be able to stop insurance companies from denying people who have pre-existing conditions is because we will make it law that they can't do that anymore. Just like we made it laws to put seat belts in the cars. And you know the car companies didn't want to do that. But we made them because the people of the country thought that that was a good idea. And that's the same thing we're going to do here. We're going to make it law law of the land will say no insurance company can deny any American citizen, because this does not cover illegal immigrants, as has been stated, uh, people have tried to state, does not. Um, section 246 of the bill, if you want to go and read it, that, that these people will be covered by the insurance companies. And it will be the law of the land that they will have to cover them. And it will be the law of the land that whatever the number may be, it may be $4,000 a year, it may be $5,000 a year, that no one can pay more than four or $5,000 a year in health care costs. So that no American goes bankrupt again because of a health care catastrophe that ha happens to their family. That will be law. And so those will be the protections that, that we will set up and then have a panel with the Surgeon General, health care uh, experts in the health care field, set up this essential benefits package so that when you go, whether you're getting subsidies or not, you will go to the marketplace and the bottom line coverage will be dental, eye, maternity, hospital visits, you know what I mean? So we'll build it into the system to where they have to, they have to cover these things. This is the insurance exchange you're talking about. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my question also is you talked about how there will be different plans and, and you know, so uh, there will be, uh, you know, the basic plan, the premium plan, the Cadillac plan. Uh, does that mean that people who have more means will be able to afford better health care? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, there's nothing that you can do about it. If you're filthy rich, you're going to get really, really good health care, mm -hmm. you know. But I think what we want to do is say in America, there should be a base level of coverage because it's a human right. It's not a luxury. And because it's a human right, everyone should have pretty good health care. Now, not everyone's going to have the health care that someone who is worth $100 million is going to have. Um, you know, but our, our idea here is not to take that health care away from somebody who has it already. Or if you have a really good health care plan, we don't want to take that from you. It's not in anybody's interest to do that. But it's about lifting all these other people up and putting protections in place to make sure that, again, this is a human right, that you can't get denied coverage. So, yeah, people who have money will have probably be able to buy that premium Cadillac plan. But everyone will have basic health care, and that will save everyone money. And if you, are, if you do have good coverage now, you're, you're paying for it. But you're also paying for these 30 million people who don't have coverage at all, and they go to the emergency room. So everyone who has health care right now is going to benefit from this because we're going we're to save money because we're going to have all this prevention in place. Beth, thank you. Thank you. Jim Rose. Jim? Jim is uh, in corporate wellness from Canfield, feels there is too much emphasis on treatment and not enough on prevention. Your question. Good evening, Congressman. <laughs> discussion is always good, but, but from my end of things, it seems like all the discussion is on the back end of it. How to, to get insurance costs under control, how to get medical costs under control, prescription costs under control. When really the facts of the matter is almost 80% of all illness is preventable. Almost 90% of what's billed to insurance is preventable. And about 95% of prescription drugs are maintenance drugs, which is a nice way of saying they're not really curing anything, they're controlling things. I've heard you allude a few times to, to preventative care. And I'm just looking to see how we're going to, if we could fix the problem before it starts, if we make people healthier, so they don't get sick. Is there going to be anything in here for that? This whole thing is designed for that, is to have, first of all, everyone has care. I mean, and you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you have said it more articulately than I have. I mean, that, that is exactly what we need to do, because we are paying everything on the back end when we could be preventing it um, on the front end. We, out, out of every health care dollar that we spend, four cents is on prevention. Four cents of every health care dollar is on prevention. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. If we're going to spend all of this money, let's get it up front. So what we've done in this system is we've eliminated co-pays for preventative services so that there's no excuse not to do it, both in the regular plans, the, the, the private exchange, the public option, but also in Medicare. We want Medicare recipients to go and get preventative care um, as well. And we think that that relationship, two things. One is the, the relationship between the doctor and the patient. And by having these people, instead of going to the emergency room, going to family docs um, and, and, having, and building a relationship with a doctor, and then rewarding doctors for the increased health of their patient and rewarding patients for their increase. You should get rewarded if you, if you quit smoking. You should have lower premiums. You know, you should have, you should be rewarded for exercising and, and you know, whatever. But that will be in the, in, by having these people have a relationship with a doctor and by investing in our docs too and, and making sure they get trained properly and they look at things differently, that I think that will help also create the kind of atmosphere for prevention. And then again, with, insu with the insurance companies having to cover everyone. That is a significant change in what we're talking about. You're going to be a busy guy, you know, because insurance companies are going to go to all these businesses who, who they work with and interact with and provide insurance for. And now, as I said earlier, the game is 
you got diabetes, how do we shake this person? How do we deny them coverage and get them off our rolls because we know they're going to cost us money with insulin and everything else, and then they're really going to get expensive if it gets bad? Now, the insurance company is going to say, how do we make you healthy? How do we work with the business owner to keep your pool of people who are coming to our plan? How do we keep you healthy? What do we have to do? Do we have to pay for you to, you know, premium the decreases if you, if you uh, exercise? Or how many of your people smoke that don't smoke now? And we want, you know, um, we want verification from the family docs that they all go to now because everyone, those kinds of things. So you get that profit motive that the insurance companies will have to keep people healthy. And I think that is something that is going to transform the system. I don't think it can be underestimated by making sure that everybody's covered. I, I think you're, you alluded to it earlier. Your chart is actually worse than, than what I present to businesses. We say insurance, you know, based health care is up 87 percent since 2000. Your chart goes back to 1999. And, and I guess when I'm in front of business owners, especially small business owners, that's their biggest concern is, yeah, we love the program. We want our employers or our employees healthier, but we can't afford it. And, and I guess what you're telling me is by once this program is in place, the insurance companies are going to kind of pick up the ball and run with it. I'm not so sure that'll happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's going to save them money. I mean, you know, if, if you're an insurance company and, you know, you, there's a business person who has 100 employees and you know you're covering them all and you're gonna you know you, they're they're your people you're married to them all you're gonna pay for them one way or the other um, you're not getting rid of them there's no shaking them you know uh, there's no jacking up the premium so high or making it so expensive for the business that he starts let he or she starts letting people go there's none of that anymore because you'll you can't do that so now they're gonna sit down with the business person and business people are going to hire guys like you or insurance companies are going to hire fellows like you and say, okay, what do we do to save money here? Because we're all in this together now. And I think that's important. I mean, th that's a significant transformational effect that's going to happen just by having universal coverage. So I can claim you as a business partner now? <laughs> you can. You can have my chart too if you want. <laughs> Jim, thank you. thank you. David Williams. David is a repairman from Mineral Ridge. And he thinks that we need less government intervention in our health care system. David? The old saying, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, isn't just a joke, it's a tragedy. The parts of the medical community that are in trouble have government intervention in them now. You alluded to something a few minutes ago that doctors who have patients who are more well are going to be rewarded. There's a law of unintended consequences that Democrats don't seem to understand. If I'm a doctor and my patients being well means I'm going to make more money, I'm not going to have people who misbehave. Why should I tolerate you know, a patient that smokes? Get rid of them. You talk about illegal aliens won't be covered. Yes, they will. They're being covered right now. Are they not going to get medical treatment? Another point you, ju you just made on, too, you said that medical care is a right. No, it is not. It is a privilege. <laughs> and just because a room anywhere has more people vocal about something doesn't make it right. Your question, David? Why do you think that there's any constitutional authority for Congress to enter into this? Congress has been involved in health care for a long time. And I think there are millions and millions of senior citizens, if you say Medicare is unconstitutional, who would disagree with you. And we may have an honest disagreement here. And if you think the government should not be involved in providing health care for seniors in the Medicare program, and if you think the government should not be involved in the Social Security system, for example, which is a government-run program, then you and I are going to have a pretty honest disagreement on what the role of government is. And I think that's fair. Just but I think that Congress does have a right to be involved in things like this, provide for the general welfare of the people. They are, it no. has been, it has Promote been. Promote the general welfare. 
not provide. Learn the Constitution, Congressman. I will. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. We have an honest disagreement. I'm you disagree with the Constitution? No, I disagree with you. <laughs> I, okay. I disagree with you. And I'll say this, and, I, and, I, and I will say this, that I believe that there is a limited role for government. And I believe that that limited role that government has is to protect its citizens. When corporations, in this particular instance, insurance companies, are behaving in a manner that is cruel, that is inhumane, that hurts people for profit, then I think the government has a responsibility through its elected officials, through elections, to moderate that type of behavior. And that happened when we instituted a 40-hour work week. That happened when we instituted eight hours a day. That happened when we put in Social Security. That happened when we put in Medicare so that our seniors would have some dignity towards the end of life. Now, you may not support those, which is fine. This is America. It's a great country. But I do. David, do you have a follow-up question? Real quickly, we're running out of time. My basic question is, though, you go against the Constitution. Why? You know, where do you think you have that ability? I disagree with your interpretation of the Constitution. I think elected officials have every right to institute programs as the people see fit. And there will be an election in two years. And if the people don't like what we've done, they'll throw us out. And you may be for that. And you may be putting up somebody's yard sign in your yard to support that. Mm -hmm. It's America. It's great. That is a state's right, though. Okay, David, yeah. thank yes. you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have uh, just one minute remaining. Is Megan DeGroff, attorney from Poland here? Megan, quickly, if you could. Megan feels that overspending with government programs like Medicare and Medicaid is driving up the cost of health care for the ordinary privately insured Congress or consumer. Congressman Ryan, I appreciate your time tonight. I'll make it brief. You spoke a lot about the dissemination of health information through panels of cardiologists establishing standards of care or panels um, bringing wellness care that insurance companies would regulate their um, clients or customers. How would this work with the HIPAA privacy law, in your opinion? Congressman, we have one minute. Uh, I don't think uh, it would affect HIPAA all that much. I mean, I, you know, obviously, as we implement some reforms, but I think privacy is a, is a key component of health care. And I think as we decentralize it, we get it further down to the docks, I think it will be... 30 seconds. Um, it will be um, protected. And, you know, again, we have to use the technology that we have, and we're putting you know, billions of dollars into medical technology, too, to protect this kind of information okay. that I think everyone is concerned about. Congressman, thank you. Thanks to members of the audience, and thanks to the Jewish Community Center for allowing us to use their facilities tonight. And we thank you for joining us. Good night. Okay. Sorry, I cut you short there at the end. I was getting